Hi, I'm Dr. Bob Aklaria from Center for Advanced Parotid and Facial Nerve Surgery. Today we're going to talk about the different reconstructive techniques after a parotidectomy has been done. Reconstruction is a little bit different in different areas. So this whole thing is the parotid gland. This part here we call the tail of the parotid. Right. And when you do a cross section of the parotid, the parotid is thickest behind the jaw. So this is the jaw area, right? So the section of the parotid behind the jaw is thickest because it has an opportunity to go deeper behind this jaw area and into the neck, right? So if you were to do a cross section like this, you would see the jaw as, let's say, this is the jawbone, like that. And the parotid would be something like this. So this area thickest, and then as you come over the jaw, it gets thinner, and as you go forward, it gets even thinner, okay? So the reconstruction you would have in the tail would be different because it's a thicker tissue um, as compared to a reconstruction of a tumor that's in the front part of the parotid, right, where things are thinner and smaller, right? So there's a lot less tissue that needs to get replaced. Generally speaking, in this area, if you take out a wedge of parotid along with the tumor, you can bring that area back together and close it, and I'll show you. And then if you have tumors in these areas, then the reconstruction based on the size and proportion can, can either be a primary closure or using of the muscle of the neck, okay? So let's go through this. Remove all of a small parotid tumor. So this is the gland itself. You can see the tumor here as being small. The incision, it's almost always the same size, the microparotidectomy incision. You can see the facial nerve monitoring probes that are monitoring the function of the nerve. So anytime during surgery, I get close to this facial nerve. These are gonna give me an alert, an extra measure of safety, which gives me confidence, extra confidence. Uh, that I could always use when addressing the facial nerve and which has really minimized um, facial nerve injury, the, the rate being significantly lower than 1%, much, much, much lower than 1%. In the literature, they talk about 1% to 3% being, being the rate, so uh, for our center, is significantly lower than a percent, which is, which is great because that facial nerve is too important, too important. So for a small tumor like this, that we have here. Let me try to mark it out a little bit better. Um, the surgery involves first making the incision in the green line, then finding the nerves that go to your earlobe and the skin here. This is the nerve for feeling, so called the greater auricular nerve. It comes out from behind this neck muscle and goes up there. And I always find it and stretch it out of the way to protect it. Then I go in, find the branches of the facial nerve that are in that local area, remove the tumor along with an extra bit of parotid tissue. And since the distance is not too much, I can bring the two edges together, essentially. And that's what I'll do. This is a primary closure, right? This is closed. And then I can lay the skin back down. So this is the skin layer. And in the skin layer, I have this, what I'm marking as green, called the SMAS layer, which separates the skin from the parotid. This is the layer the plastic surgeons use to do a facelift. I put that down, close the incision right there, and I don't usually use a drain when I, have to, when I can do a primary closure because there's not a lot of oozing. I do use a pressure dressing to make sure that these layers are sticking right to the parotid gland and there's no space between them for saliva to accumulate, right? Now, if I can't bring them together because the gap is a little bit much. Sometimes I'll take a little bit of fat, right? And I'll make a tiny incision in the belly button and get the fat and put it in that gap, right? And then close and put the skin down. And that can be very easily done and the incision at the belly button, it heals very well. It's well hidden inside the belly button. And we all 
have a little bit of extra fat down there that we could use, fortunately. Even when you're very, very thin, you, there is still some fat that can be used for the reconstruction. Um, now, if you have a larger tumor, um, like this, right, and I'm trying to take out the tumor, again, with a little bit of extra carotid tissue, um, again, I'll sell, save the greater auricular nerve for sensation, and I'll find the facial nerve and all the branches, all the relevant branches in the area, remove the tumor and the extra product tissue around it, which is leaving me here a large gap. I'm not going to be able to overcome this gap by bringing the two edges together. It's just not enough tissue. And so then I have a fantastic reconstructive tissue, which is the muscle of your neck. It's this muscle, which attaches from your skull all the way to the clavicle. So the long muscle, right? This muscle has blood vessels coming from above and below. So I take advantage of that fact and I'll use a small portion of the muscle with its own blood vessel. I insert it in there. I suture it into place, right? To the parotid, fill in the defect, then put the skin and that SMAS layer on top, therefore separating the product from the skin to prevent Frey syndrome, create a smooth contour, right? And also make sure there's no defects or hollowness in that area of surgery. It also adds a layer of protection above the facial nerve, right? So that the nerve is not immediately under the skin so that any trauma could really immediately uh, cause injury to the nerve. And usually when I do this, I use a drain, which goes through a, a small hole I make next to the hairline, and this drain comes next to the muscle. When I use muscle reconstruction, there's extra oozing. That's why I need to use the drain. If I don't have to use the muscle, I don't use the drain. There are some centers in the country where instead of using this muscle, we'll go get muscle or tissue from your forearm with its blood vessel, come and put it there along and connect it to the blood vessels in the neck. I find that to be a little bit of an overkill because you have a very good healthy muscle locally that can be used without extending the surgery without extending the incision, needing to go into the neck and find blood vessels. Uh, the procedure where you use a free flap, which is a flap with a blood vessel free to attach to that, has many hours of extra surgery, whereas this only adds 20 minutes, 30 minutes perhaps of extra time during the surgery. So it's an easy reconstruction with local tissue without having to affect your arm or any other part of your body. This is my preferred technique. Rarely, rarely I'll use what's called alloderm, which is cadaveric skin. I don't think I've used it in the past eight years. So it is rare when someone has a very thick face and they don't have enough tissue, or if I have to remove a lot of the tissue because they may have a cancer invading there, then I may resort to that. I prefer not to use that technique and I prefer to use the techniques that I discussed. Primary closure, fat, or muscle flap. And the bigger defects, I prefer the muscle flap, and the smaller defects, I prefer closing locally or using a little bit of fat. If you're interested in clear product information and minimally invasive ways to treat product disease, visit us at productmd.com. Like this video, subscribe to us, ask questions so I can know how to make more videos that address your particular needs. Be well.